class, I'm Dr. Jody Richardson Delgado. Welcome to Psych 101. Today we're going to be talking about memory. Memory is an internal record the brain receives and stores and may be retrieved for later use. Memory is a constructive process. One of the models or theories of memory is the three-stage model of memory. There are other theories of memory that you might read about in your textbook, but this is one of the most, most common and most widely used. So we have three stages in this model. The first stage is sensory memory. The second stage is short-term, also called working memory. And the final stage is long-term memory. All of these stages within this process have to be gone through in order for things to actually be stored into our long-term memory and then for us to be able to retrieve the information from long-term memory that actually happens in short-term or working memory. So with our sensory memory, the duration is a half a second to about two to four seconds depending on what sense we are working with. So with the iconic memory or our eyes, we have about a half a second duration. And if we don't pay attention during that time and grab that information and move it to the working memory, it's lost. Same way with auditory, you'll also hear echoic memory. Um, echoic memory lasts about two to four seconds. So we have about two to four seconds to decide if that information is really important and move it into working memory before it's lost. Now, with echoic or auditory memory, this is one of the reasons why we have about two to four seconds to answer that question that maybe you've said, huh, to? So you're sitting in your bedroom and your mom yells up to you, hey, it's time for dinner. And you say, what? Oh, okay, I'll be right down. Because you've heard what she said, but you're actually doing something else. You have to switch your attention. And because we're able to hold on to it in our auditory memory for just two to four seconds, we're able to register what was said to us. And again, it's easier when it's short sentences or short phrases that we can hold on to. And then we move that into working memory. Now, with working memory or short-term memory, we're talking about 30-second time is about all we have with working memory. So we work on that information that has come in through our sensory memory for about 30 seconds. We can also hold about five to nine items, about the same number as we have in our phone numbers or our social security numbers. What the working memory does is that it directs information into our long-term memory. It also brings information out of our long-term memory for us to use as we are working on it. So as you're learning things in class and you're sitting and listening and watching the PowerPoint slides in front of you, your working memory is working on that and storing that into your long-term memory. When you're sitting and taking a test in that class, your short-term memory is retrieving that information from your long-term memory. Now with long-term memory, this is relatively permanent and the capacity is really unknown at this point. We don't know how much our long-term memory can hold and we don't know for how long. There are different types of long-term memories that we have. This is a model of long-term memory. So you can see there's two categories and four subcategories. There's explicit memory and implicit memory. With explicit memory, we have semantic memory, which is general facts. Two plus two is four. The father of psychology is Wilhelm Wundt. Your episodic memory, I think of as episodes or experiences in your life. So remembering your high school graduation, remembering the first day that your parents brought home your baby brother or baby sister. Then we have implicit memories. And implicit memories, we have procedural memory, which is how to perform actions. These are things that are automatic, that we've learned to just set automatically so our brain can concentrate on other things. An example of this would be riding a bike or brushing your teeth. When you were first learning those things, you really had to go step by step through the procedure. But after a few times, that just becomes an automatic process for you. And that's a procedural memory. We also have other types of implicit memory that we believe are things like attitudes and may even include phobias. 
Sensory memory, some of the things that we know that can help us enhance our sensory memory, the biggest one is to pay attention. If we focus on it, we are more likely to remember it. Attention plays a key role in all of the processes of memory. Also using echoic memory to our advantage, knowing that we can hold on to something for two to four seconds. With short-term memory, we can do things like chunk information. Like I was saying before with the phone numbers being chunked into three digits and then four digits. When we chunk information, it actually helps us organize the information and work on it in our working memory a little bit longer and encode it into our long-term memory in an organized way. The other thing that we can do to help with short-term memory is called maintenance rehearsal. So this is when you repeat that information to yourself over and over again. So you're supposed to remember somebody's phone number and you don't have your cell phone to type it into. So you repeat that information over and over again. Five, 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 five. That's maintenance rehearsal. So it keeps it in your working memory a little bit longer so it has more time to be encoded into your long-term memory. We can also use elaborative rehearsal. And this is where we link current information that we're working on with maybe some information from our past or another memory that we can bring to our working memory. So for example, if I need to remember someone's name and this person walks up to me and she says her name is Mary and she has brown hair and brown eyes. And I start to think about her name and I look at her and she kind of looks like my Aunt Mary. And so when I see her walking towards me the next time, I can think of my Aunt Mary and hopefully recall her name. That's part of elaborative rehearsal. We rehearse that person's name and associate it with several different parts of memories that we have, maybe of other people or other things that are similar to that. That helps encode it into our long-term memory in a lot of different ways. The other thing and probably the most important thing to do while we are using our working memory is to pay attention. That can't be emphasized enough. Now with our long-term memory, some of the tips that we know that are helpful for remembering things and pulling things from our long-term memory is to find meaning in what it is that we are trying to learn. Because when what we are trying to remember means something to us, either on an emotional level or on an intellectual level, or we can see how we would use it in the future, we're more likely to remember it. And it's more likely to be encoded accurately into our long-term memory. The other thing we know that really impacts our long-term memory is getting good sleep. What happens during sleep is that the memories consolidate and we actually are able to organize some of the information that happened to us throughout the day. And we find that people who've had a good night's sleep remember things better than those that have not had a good night's sleep. So it's important to sleep before those important exams that you're taking. The other thing that we know is distribute the practice over time. So don't try to cram for that test right before, but distribute your practice of the material that it is that you want to learn over a week or several days so that it gives you time to come back to that material so that you can work on it a little bit more. Another thing that's very helpful is to use deep processing. Now there's shallow, medium, and deep processing. With shallow processing, you're really not going to remember anything but just the surface ideas, the surface things. With medium processing, you are going to start to see possibly some patterns or maybe get some ideas from that information. But with the deep processing, this is where we really spend a lot of time and we start to absorb that information and associate it and understand in more depth how that information can impact other things that are, we are learning about maybe in other classes or other things that we've learned about in the class that we're currently taking. So deep processing is really important and we need time to do that. And that's why paying attention is so important is that paying attention to what it is that we are learning is really important. So silencing your cell phone as you are trying to learn something so your attention can stay on what it is you're learning. I wanna thank you for being with me today. I hope this video has helped you and I hope to see you in future videos.